like if we treated the climate emergency as seriously as COVID-19. I've learned two important lessons so far from the pandemic. Uh, the first is that change can take place quickly. And the second is that government and societal priorities can shift dramatically to tackle an emergency. My third observation, not a, a lesson as such, but something that has sparked my interest, is that in the same way that climate science and scientists find themselves scrutinised for clear facts when policymakers are faced with the need to engage with the science, our medical colleagues find themselves and their science also thrust into this spotlight. Moreover, they too are now tackling the same economy in terms of GDP versus science debate that many climate researchers have been struggling with for decades. So I'd just like to take a few minutes to reflect on these lessons and observations and to consider what can be harnessed to tackle the climate emergency, not least because the way in which COVID has become all consuming, leading to a rapid policy, society and media response that I suspect hasn't been experienced before by any of us during our lifetimes. This really draws attention to how little credence has been given to the term emergency in a climate rather than a COVID-19 context. So first on the speed of response and government priorities. I've spent the last 18 years trying to understand the scale of the climate emergency and how our energy systems need to transform to minimise cumulative carbon emissions. Energy systems can sound a bit technical, but what basically it means is how you and I use energy every day, what we use it for, when we use it, how much we use and where it comes from. The climate emergency that we're facing is so great that mitigating the damage that we are doing now and the damage that will be done in the future requires much more than just incrementally increasing the amount of renewable electricity on our national grid, for example. We need to consider all the ways we consume energy, from travelling to heating our homes, cooking to industrial manufacture of goods. And critically, we need to do this quickly because greenhouse gas emissions are accumulating. That's why it's not just about technology. We know that a wide variety of technical solutions exist for cutting CO2, but some will take decades to be sufficiently widespread to make the difference that is actually needed in the next five or 10 years, or indeed was actually needed during the last decade. Coming from a physical sciences and modelling background myself, but spending most of my career working with engineers and social scientists, I know that modelling theoretically how an idealised technology such as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage might cut CO2 is very different to the much more complicated process of widespread and rapid infrastructure deployment into society. There are many examples we're familiar with, the construction of new nuclear power stations, retrofitting alternative technologies for heating into every single UK home, designing and deploying an extensive network of electric vehicles and charging points, and perhaps most importantly in the current debate, the large scale rollout of new, largely unproven CO2 removal and storage technologies. That's why we need to pay more attention to the geographical governance and social context within which we are expecting technologies to be rapidly de deployed. Contexts that are much more challenging to articulate well, or, or if at all, in a numerical model. And this is also why it matters how much energy we consume. If we can consume less, then we won't need to transform as much of our high carbon infrastructure, or indeed deploy new unproven technologies to remove CO2 from our atmosphere, that our energy consumption has put there. But cutting energy consumption or demand is rarely the focus of CO2 mitigation discussions as the debate on decarbonising aviation testifies. And um, remember, we mustn't mention curtailing our flying. So consuming less energy has taken a back seat in policy debates to decarbonising our energy supply. And one of the reasons for this is that it requires changes to individual and collective behaviour, attitudes and expectations. Another is it requires us to make large upfront strategic investment choices for the long term and pay more attention to issues of justice and equity. Tackling behaviour, inequality and redirecting investment for future generations are all seemingly more politically sensitive than a focus on large scalable technologies and short term capital spend and aspects that challenge the pretense of security provided by protecting GDP growth in wealthy nations. But they are also aspects where COVID-19 responses have illustrated change and potential willingness to change what we do, what we invest in, and how quickly this needs to happen are not far beneath the surface. 
So some examples, um, there probably isn't a person listening to this who hasn't changed one of their individual common practices or habits in recent months. It might be a lower frequency of traveling to work or a way of getting in a weekly shop or a walk now more regularly done to boost well-being. Collective and community behaviors have shifted rapidly too. There are higher expectations on people being more available to attend meetings, not necessarily a good thing, but also my more diverse group of people who are willing to interact within those meetings or than they would in other settings. Some of us know more of our neighbours or we might be sharing activities to avoid more individual trips to the shops. Finally, the government's budget plans have been thrown up in the air with finance redirected towards furloughing schemes, constructing hospital infrastructure or maintaining public transport systems while demand is falling through the floor. So we've learned from COVID-19 that people can work and live differently. We can accept less commuting, less flying, less buying and material goods, all energy consuming activities. But I'm not trying to pretend that change hasn't been extremely tough for many. We've accepted these changes because we know that there is a threat to human society. If we actually recognise the climate emergency as a similar threat to human society, then would we see action that's commensurate with the shifts that we really need? It would require us to pause and rethink every investment made, every job created, every policy measure on the table, every decision that we find ourselves part of. But at the same time, we need to take on board the learning that has presented itself due to this rapid societal change so we can embed where we need to pay attention to the societal concerns, backlash or inertia. But perhaps then the trend in rising CO2 emissions could start to be overturned and sustainably so. So turning now to what we might learn or take from the way in which the science and the scientists associated with COVID-19 have been plunged into the spotlight. It was reported in a recent BBC article that the government was quite prominently flagging early on that it has been following the science. So what can we learn from how this has been playing out? Similar to climate change, there is a reasonable understanding of the short term impacts of COVID-19 on people. Like there is a good understanding of the impact of rising CO2 emissions on temperatures or sea level rise. Also similarly, the wider societal outcomes of both rising CO2 or the pandemic are much less clear. There are also similarities on the mitigation side. Tackling the virus at an early stage through targeted test and trace and lockdown will lead to a decline in infections. Likewise for CO2, a reduction in energy consumption while low carbon technologies are deployed will reduce the production of CO2 emissions. But as has already been discussed, reducing energy consumption or investing in the scale of low carbon technology deployment needed butts up against our seemingly immovable attachment with protecting GDP growth. This is similar to the measures to tackle the virus, although there is clearly an added complication that a limit to medical capacity additionally requires trade-offs between different health concerns, COVID treatments versus cancer treatments. But isn't this the same problem, that investment could cover both, but this is being chosen not to be prioritised? The other contrast between the COVID and climate emergencies is that the science behind tackling the rising COVID-19 infections is less advanced than the science and interdisciplinary understanding of our CO2 mitigation options. As a plethora of climate change mitigation measures are overlooked on the basis of their potential impact on GDP growth, the academic community has increasingly come up with ever more speculative options to feed into the models and technologies that paint a rosier picture and avoid wider shifts in society or heaven forbid focusing on equity and the distribution of high carbon activities. The COVID debate doesn't appear to have reached that point yet, but perhaps there are lessons for our colleagues in medicine to be learned from the climate field in this regard. There will always be a range of scientific views on any high profile issue and they will end up being scrutinised in the popular press and by policymakers and commentators alike. But when policymakers hold up GDP growth as a red line, our scientific understanding and judgment mustn't be clouded as a consequence. While our models can be made to show theoretically that speculative options do the job within the political red lines, we must remain true to our areas of expertise and avoid our judgment being clouded by a policymaker's enthusiasm for political feasibility. So drawing this to a close, if, if we were to respond to the climate emergency with the same significance as the pandemic, what should or shouldn't we be doing? First, 
we need to recognise the positives and opportunities presented by the large, large scale societal shift we've been seeing. We need to learn the lessons from the societal concerns that have emerged, the backlash or inertia to COVID-19 related measures and the focus on what matters most to people, friends and family, jobs, time. Bringing our physical and social scientists and engineers together, we must build this new understanding into our dialogue with policy and decision makers for the benefit of the climate debate. Second, we need to encourage government and decision makers to rethink every investment made, every job created, every policy measure on the table, and every decision they make, or indeed we find ourselves a part of, and ask, does it reduce energy demand? Will it provide a sufficiently rapid transition to a low carbon energy system? Clear investment is at this crucial pivot point could positively transform systems and society away from fossil fuels while simultaneously improving employment, equality and health and well-being. Third, we need to challenge the apparent red lines. Overcoming our obsession with GDP growth in wealthy nations and exploring alternative measures or prosperity is essential right at this moment and this debate could take on new momentum. Space to challenge this obsession has been created and those such as Julia with the tools and understanding to challenge the economic paradigm have an opportunity to be listened to. Not only has COVID-19 given us lessons that we can learn from, but it has also created a flux in our everyday routines. We all need to take advantage of this flux to develop and influence policies that can lead to a sufficiently deep, rapid, but sustained response to the climate emergency. If we don't take advantage of this moment in time where we have demonstrated that society can accept deep change, then we will pass up our opportunity of a lifetime to help future generations. Thank you.